Welcome back, everybody. It's the Fantasy Pros Dynasty Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bogman. Follow me on the Twitter at Bogman Sports. I'm joined, as always, by Pat Fitzmorris at Fitz underscore FF on the Twitter machine. Fitzy, how you doing this week? Bugs, I'm doing great. I mean, it's uh, 90 something degrees outside with like 112 percent humidity so there's really no place i'd rather be than here in the air conditioning talking fantasy football with you and uh, our guest who's a great guest by the way even though i i yelled at him on the scott fishbowl potathon so <laughs> russ you're gonna take that it's it's russ fisher at dynasty outhouse from the dynasty addicts uh, podcast network russ how you doing are you gonna take that from fitzy Yes. <laughs> yeah. Should I should I explain why I yelled at him? Yeah, why did you yell at him? Right, so why we've, are you yelling we've at anyone? Got the fantasy football expo coming up in Canton, Ohio, and and uh, you know, Russ was co-hosting the Scott Fishbowl Podathon, and he's trying to tell everyone about this great breakfast spot in Canton, Ohio, that's right by the <laughs> hotel, that's sort of the uh, you know home base for all the festivities. It's super close, but like. It's kind of a small place and uh you know i love this place i mean as far as breakfast places go maybe one of the best i've ever been to and and wow. i lived in you know on the north side of chicago for eight years where there are great breakfast places all over and this place is up there with any of them i'm not even going to mention the name because it's, it's so called good. george's <laughs> it's on third ave <laughs> it's, it's wonderful yeah, this, this place is awesome and uh you know i want to be able to get a table there and uh russ was not helping in that regard <laughs> oh, it, it, I, every year we go we've got well i guess the past two years because pre-covid it was you know in a different hotel but like these past two years that we've gone we've gone there for breakfast every single day and like every single day Zach Reed and I like literally do a little dance down the street as like <laughs> gonna get some breakfast, gonna get some breakfast, and you leave singing the same song just a little slower because your belly's mm. just full. Wish I hadn't ate so much breakfast. No, 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 no. I... You, you know, <laughs> oh man, we just ate some breakfast. It was such good breakfast. Time I need a, a nap, nap now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think everyone's had that uh, breakfast song before, man. I mean, I'm usually not awake for breakfast, but if that place is open past noon, uh, like till two o'clock, like some of those breakfast spots are, I am all about it. So uh, I at breakfast food, I, I don't know why. I think I love breakfast food so much because I'm such a night owl and I'm never like usually awake for breakfast. So it's like a rare treat for me when I'm awake early enough for breakfast. I really like to go get breakfast. So uh, well, but it's, yeah. it's like Parks and Recreation where Leslie and Ron were sitting across from each other eating at a diner and eating breakfast. So like, why do people eat things other than breakfast food? And Ron just goes, people are idiots, people are Leslie. More. People are idiots. Yeah. Like that's, <laughs> that, that's the real answer. It's just like breakfast food is the best. It is fantastic. It is wonderful and should be eaten and is allowed to be eaten just anytime you want. Speaking of wonderful and amazing things today, we're going to be talking about crossroad players on the podcast. These are players that look, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to say, you know, or get off the pot, but it's like, what, what are we going to do here? Are we going to become an upper echelon player? Are we going to become some of these guys? We, we go as low as, are we draftable players or are you just kind of a jag? You're another guy in here that is, you know, last round fodder. Uh, RB handcuff or wide receiver by week guy. Like we want to know if these players are going to take the next step into stardom or are they going to revert to what the NFL stands for, for the most part, not for long. Right. So uh, we're going to get into those. We're going to start with Russ's. But before we do, I got to tell you guys that we have a winner. The winner of the ultimate custom one on one championship belt, courtesy of Trophy Smack, is Michael Minardi. Please get in touch with our customer support agents at mailbag at fantasypros.com with your mailing address and proof of subscription to Fantasy Pros YouTube channel, and we will be in touch. Again, the winner is Michael Minardi. Congratulations to you to take part in the next giveaway, which is a Kenneth Walker signed jersey, which uh, I wish I could win that. Uh, all you have to do is subscribe to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel and comment on this video. That's it. Also, if you love our content, please uh, give us a like and a click and click that bell to get notified each time a new video drops. All right, Russ, I will hand it to you. Uh, who do you want to talk about first here? Well, first, I want to talk about you for a second. I read the fine print. I did not see anything that said 
podcasters can't win <laughs> their contest. So <laughs> I, I'm subscribed. I can comment. Exactly. So, so but see, the comment like, is then I have to read the rest of the comments and then I get my feelings hurt a lot. So, so it, you know, no, 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 you know, you, you never read the comments, man. You don't <laughs> better than that. But you just you get in there, you put in your name in the hat for the jersey, and then you run away crying. Like that's 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 how you handle you comments. Go. I like it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can do that. So uh, <laughs> you, we got uh, three players for you, three players yes. for Fitzy, and then I've got four. But uh, you're up first, Russ. Who you got? <sighs> I have two that make me sad and one that I've come to terms on already. So let's, let's, let's Oreo sandwich this one with sadness on the outside. So my first one is DeAndre Swift. And I've been a fan of Swift from the very beginning, but it was one of those cases where everyone else liked him a lot more than I did. So his price, his ADP, his everything was f way too high. And then last year, it starts to get to a good place. And this off this offseason, I'm just like, yes, let's go, let's go. And then they draft Jameer Gibbs. And then you're like, all right, well, they have to trade him, right? And it was like the scariest 20 minutes of a DeAndre <laughs> Swift fan's life. And then he goes to Philly. And I'm just like, mm. like, where else do you want your running back to go? Like, that is literally like the best spot to land in right now. And all I'm saying is there was a certain wide receiver who we would say is a top three wide receiver if he could just stay healthy for the year. Had all of these soft tissue injuries in Tennessee, goes to Philadelphia, and has a full season with no injuries. So clearly that is medical fact in Philly. The Tennessee so, water. Yeah, and that Detroit water it. also. But Philly well, water Detroit keeps... Water's famous keeps you very, very hydrated and keeps those uh, tendons and ligaments nice and intact. So if Swift stays healthy, Swift still is a guy that is not going to get 80% of touches. He should not. His body apparently can't hold up to it anyway. But like, there's a chance Swift can walk in to be a top 10 fantasy running back this year based on that offense, even if he just sticks with that, what felt like 40-ish percent workload out of Detroit. Like that's and I'm ready for it and I'm here for it. But if this season he finishes as like RB 15, RB 18, it's like, all right, he's a running back too. Yeah, I mean, Fitz, it's hard to know uh, what to expect from DeAndre Swift. His ECR for Dynasty right now is RB 19 uh, points per game in PPR the last three seasons, RB 16, RB 10, RB 18. But he has missed 10 games over those three seasons and he's only eclipsed. Uh, 200 touches one time in those three uh, seasons. And you and I have talked about how it seems like Philly kind of likes Rashad Penny more. They went out and signed him first. Uh, he got first team reps the first day of camp. I don't know if that really means anything because day two, it could be Swift getting the, they j might just rotate those. But I mean, it's the news that we have right now. So people are talking about it. Does it matter because Penny will probably get hurt, but maybe DeAndre Swift will get hurt too. Fitzy, what's your take on Swift at the crossroads here? Yeah, so I agree. This was a, a great selection by Russ because he really is a crossroads player. And I loved him too coming out of Florida State. And I think one of the things we liked about him so much was because he had that pass catching skill set. And that gave him this starry Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler type ceiling. And we've seen snippets of that especially in games where Detroit got way down and all of a sudden they're peppering him with like a dozen targets in a game and uh you know sort of the the garbage time catch-up yards that's sort of my concern about him going to Philadelphia like on one hand it's great that he's going to be working behind those those glass eating offensive linemen they have in Philly on the other hand Philly had the fewest running back targets in the league last year, 61, which is fewer targets than Swift himself has seen in each of the last two seasons. So I'm a little bit concerned about the pass catching upside for this, you know, pass catching back and the fact that he's not going to be getting any of those Detroit. Oh, look at this. We're down three touchdowns in the second quarter uh, game scripts. You know, Philly's going to be trucking people and, and not needing to dump off. And they've got the mobile quarterback who's not going to be dumping off to his running backs that much. You know, if he's under duress, he's just going to take it himself and run. So I'm mixed on the landing spot for him. Very mixed. And um, 
yeah, it's going to be really fascinating to see what happens. I think if it's by some miracle Rashad Penny stays healthy for 14 plus games, I don't think we're going to see a great season for Swift. But if it's a typical Penny season and he gets hurt after about five games, then yeah, there's definitely a possibility we see a big season. All right, Russ. So if I make this statement that DeAndre Swift is more likely to be an RB1 or an RB3 after this season, which one are you picking? <laughs> see, here's, well, two things. How good of an offense would an Eagles offense with a healthy Penny and healthy Swift be? That'd be like, great. In a football sense, that would be amazing. In a fantasy football sense, we'd hate it. But, I mean, honestly, the ant- the more likely answer is RB3, just not even based on the player himself, but based on age, based on people that have just been hurt too much by him. Because as much as we want to say we are analytics driven and we the correction. Yeah. Yeah. Like we we absolutely just we get burned and we remember, you know. And our feelings hurt, right? Yeah. Like and, the comments. He's gonna probably be around <laughs> like that 25, 26 year area, getting towards a second contract, and all of a sudden we're just like, oh, that means he's old and bad now. Plus, we just got Bijan. Brees Hall is going to get healthy again. And we're going to get a couple of good running backs coming in in 24 also. And just I, Swift won't stand a chance at that point. Ranking it better than probably RB9-10 at best. And that's if he has a really good season. So chances are he scores as an RB2 again and drops to like RB22-24. And... I'll still have on a lot of my teams, but it'll make me right. sad still. <laughs> yeah, look, there, there's a lot of potential there. And I, I was higher on Swift than I was even on Taylor coming out. Uh, I was super high on him, but he has, I'm one of the people, he has disappointed me and it has upset me. So I'm kind of off the Swift bandwagon, but there's a lot of talent in there. And if the Eagles can get it out of him, uh, it would be great. Do Staley seem to be frustrated with him at least on hard knocks so uh you know maybe he's a tough player to coach i don't know but who's your second player russ i i love this one by the way see this all right so this is the one where i'm not necessarily sad about it because i wasn't like i wasn't the biggest rashad bateman guy coming in but he was good i i firmly believe that this man is a talented wide receiver and at the time it was unfortunate the offense he landed in purely because greg roman is just boring like it it was one of those uh offenses where like back you you know back in the olden days where chip kelly was running the eagles offense after a couple of years the offensive players were like defenses know what we're doing the second we line up and that's what greg roman turned into it was just the most boring thing in the world but whenever you had healthy lamar and healthy rashad bateman you were looking at solid high-end wide receiver two numbers we're getting a Todd Munkin offense, which, I mean, it's not Shanahan or, you know, uh, McVeigh or anything, but anything is better than what they've been <laughs> doing. And, and Munkin, we got a little excited when he was running the offense in, what was that, Cleveland, what felt like 10 years ago, but was probably like four. Who knows, because there's so much turnover in Cleveland. Um, so I, I'm here for it. I'm ready for it. I, I think he will do well, assuming he could stay on the field. And... It's not like Bateman, again, has the chance to walk in after a good season this season as a top 10 wide receiver. It's too late for that, given his age, given the fact that we're going to get two studs at least, assuming they both declare and all of that stuff coming in in the next draft. And it's not like Chase, Jefferson, A.J. Brown, C.D. Lamb, like not like these guys are going anywhere. So even off a fantastic season, maybe Bateman makes it to the, you know, 20 area wide receiver 20 area but if he only even if he has a mediocre season i think he is relegated to wide receiver three at best which again is good because you'll be able to get a good wide receiver two ish player on your team for wide receiver three prices but it's not what you wanted out of Rashad Bateman. Uh, i completely agree with that and, and fitzy this is a guy that i've been down on and i i keep saying you know it's not because of his skill. His skill is there. It's because of the way the offense runs and the fact that this guy can't stay on the field. Right now, his ECR is wide receiver 39. His finishes in his first two seasons, wide receiver 57, wide receiver 64, and points per game. And that's, you know, you get hurt early in a game, you get one point, it lowers your whole average. I understand. He's had some good games in there as well. Todd Monken should shake up this offense 
with more passes, but the Ravens also added a first round pick and say flowers. OBJ plus Mark Andrews will lead the team in targets as long as he's healthy. So, I mean, I like Bateman, but I don't like this offense. I don't even know if he's two or three in terms of receiving targets in this op in this offense, depending on what say flowers does in his rookie season. So I'm just low on him, but Russ is correct. He's absolutely in the crossroads. I kind of hold out hope for him to go to a different team and revive his career there. But what do you think? Can he do it in Baltimore? More target competition this year for sure. But we've got to hope that Todd Munkin grows the pie, that it's a bigger pie More to targets. be carved up. Yeah. Exactly. And Man, I mean, I, I did really like this guy as a prospect, um, watching him at the University of Minnesota since I'm a, a Big Ten guy and seeing him like I, I really thought that he had no holes in his game, you know, could line up in the slot, could line up outside, good hands, good route runner, good after the catch, um, you know, and it, I'm not our fantasy pros injury specialist dr deepak chona says not to worry too much about this uh foot thing that has sort of cropped up in training camp that it's pretty normal following the injury he had and he expects bateman to be um you know pretty close to full go and 100 percent by september i believe so yeah i mean it's it's he is a great crossroads guy because this is a big year and, and whether he can carve out a role for himself. And I mean, that might depend largely on whether he can stay healthy and whether OBJ can stay healthy. Because if we're, uh, you know, doling out targets three ways between these receivers, Zay and OBJ and Bateman, and we've got, you know, Mark Andrews and Isaiah likely getting targets too at tight ends, you know, a very good tight end combination. Yeah, but, um, you know, I, I do think Bateman can be a target earner if he can stay healthy, though. Like, I think he's still good. So I'm trying to be optimistic about him. Although, you know, on the other hand, I'm not terribly sad that I only have like one dynasty share of Bateman right now. <laughs> Russ, if I come to you right now and I say, hey, I want your Rashad Bateman, I'll give you a second round pick in 2024. Are you taking the pick or are you taking the shot on Bateman? For that, I'll take the shot on Bateman. If uh, always, it's far too individualistic to give that blanket of an answer. But why at that point? Like, of course, it's it's the player you have <laughs> that either you drafted and have been holding on to this whole time, or you acquired him waiting for this, waiting for this offense to step up. And if you do believe in Bateman, you're gonna say, I'm "Not worried about flowers. It's Bateman." Of course, you're you're worried about Mark right. Andrews. He's Mark Andrews. You know that's 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 <laughs> fine. Um, but no, like one second. If you're telling me two seconds, and one of them looks like it's going to be the two hundred one, and maybe I'm rebuilding, so I don't need a three fourth year in wide receiver by the time I even start to really rebuild. I'd think about it. I would hate myself for it. I would really, but it's, it would be the right move to take two seconds. If one of them seems early enough, like that's right. Cause you're probably not getting a first for him. It's just, yeah, I don't think you get a first. It, yeah. There's just way too much uh, based around right. Bateman for, for, for you to get a first for him. So if, if I'm on a, if I'm on a rebuilding team, a, a team I decide to blow up one second, I wouldn't, I would hold, I would at that point, wait and see if he does what you want him to do and hope, hope, there's a Bateman fan in your league that'll give you a first four, even if it's like the 112. <laughs> yeah. Fitz, I'm not a Bateman fan, so I would probably take the second. What would you do in that scenario? Would you take the second or would you uh, hold on to Bateman and see what he does? Even though it's a good class, I'd hang on to Bateman. I think that's fair. And I think both answers are fair, by the way. I think that's uh, you would rather get two twos, you know, or maybe a two and a three, you know, give yourself two shots just in case Bateman does work out. I understand that, but. I don't know. I'm just not not really enthralled with Bateman and him staying on the field and all that Fair. stuff. Who who is your last player, Russ? I think this one might be a little controversial. I like it. Well, this this is me building myself up for the level of sadness. Like I talked about <laughs> Swift, a player I've liked. I talked about Bateman, a player that I knew was good. A and now I'm going to talk about Trevor Lawrence, a player who we know is good and a player that I love. And the problem isn't again with Trevor Lawrence, because let's face it, if anyone counts his rookie year against him, they don't like him. Like 
the Urban Meyer year. You can't even call it years or era. It was it was less than a year. So like that should be just completely wipes off the face of the planet. And he started to look good last year. That offense started to click. But the real problem is, is how many good quarterbacks we have right now. The top end is getting really, really nice. And it's not just Mahomes, Allen Hurts at the top and then a maybe whatever. But like a Lamar in a new offense, Burrow doesn't care about touchdown regression. He's going to keep throwing him at a really good rate. You know, Kyler, if he comes back healthy or, or even if he gets moved to a new team, Caleb Williams is going to walk in as a top 10 quarterback, most likely. Fields, if he does half of what we hope he does, we have a lot of really good quarterbacks high up. Anthony Richardson, if he's decent, he's popping up to QB six or seven. So I think what's going to happen is if we see a mediocre year of Trevor Lawrence, he's getting relegated to that QB 13, 14 area of like Dak and Tua. And again, that's insanely helpful in a super flex league. Like you, you want that because with the offense they're putting together, I mean, I'm a huge Calvin Ridley fan, so I'm here for it. Like he'll have weekly upside, but I don't think we'll be able to like right now we want to say, oh, he's not really a running quarterback, but like, hey, we got Justin Herbert, we got Joe Burrow. And, and that's, I think, what we're clinging to because of the best prospects since Peyton Manning stuff and what he can be now that we also have a few quarterbacks still up here that aren't rushers. They're sneaky athletic, if, if that, you know, gives away any undertones. Um, and I think this is a year that will really solidify whether he stays up in that top eight area or if he drops to that like 14, 15 area. Again, not off the face of the earth. This isn't like a crossroad yeah. whether he's going to retire next year. But it's a tier, a very important tier, because it's the difference between in a super flex draft getting drafted at the end of the first or the beginning of the fourth. I think, Fitz, a lot of people are not even taking this into consideration that maybe he's just okay. I think everyone expects him to take a huge leap this year because right now his ECR is seven. And he jumped from QB 33 in points per game in his rookie season with Urban Meyer and all that nonsense mm -hmm. to QB 13 just outside of a QB one last year. Um, he's a crossroads player here, but do we think he's capable of what we saw in college? And honestly, a big part of it is they got they got to let him run because they haven't really, you know, uh, Re remove the training wheels on that at all yet so they need to let him do some of that stuff that he did in college too so do you think we see it this year oh he's good man he he's good there's no question about it i mean i think i would rather have him and this is gonna upset the justin herbert fan club but like he's a better quarterback <laughs> You've already upset them who cares he's a, exactly he's a better quarterback than justin herbert he was better than herbert when they were both in college he's better now he's going to be better in the future and, um, you know, it does baffle me when I see people with Herbert higher in their rankings. I just don't understand it. But there is a chance he has like kind of a mediocre season, but it would be kind of the flukiness of low touchdown rates. And maybe he only runs for like one touchdown or none, you know, and that that tamps down his fantasy point total. Like that would be a bad season. It wouldn't be a bad season where all Hank Bigsby turns into Jamal Williams. Yeah, and they're just giving yeah, him where, all those touchdowns. Right, right where they right. get a bunch of fluky touchdowns as receivers get tackled at the one. Just one of those, and we've seen those types of seasons. Like guys who were sort of steady throughout their careers, like Matt Ryan, whose yardage total you could set your clock to every year, but like his touchdown counts would be all over the place. So we could get that kind of unlucky touchdown season for Trevor Lawrence, but we're not going to see him all of a sudden complete like 56% of his passes. That's just not going to happen. He's too good. And Doug Peterson, and, you know, he was the guy to bring out the best in Trevor Lawrence. So, um, you know, if he does have that fluky bad touchdown season and drops to quarterback 13, I'll be buying. Like, I'll be, I'll be putting out offers to all the Trevor Lawrence managers out there. Yeah, I'm with ECR. I got him at seven. Russ, can I ask you where you have him among your dynasty QBs right now? I It is very sweet of you to assume that I actually do rankings. Um, <laughs> but, but he's around that area. He's in that. Yeah. It's usually around like Top eight, 10. nine, where yeah. you, you hit that Herbert Lawrence Fields area and it's pick your poison kind of thing. And mine is usually who, Lawrence. Who would you rather so, have, Russ, Lawrence or Herbert? 
I am a scaredy cat is really what it comes down to. I am very risk averse. I would take Herbert because we've seen that eliteness with it's really funny. I was having an argument yesterday because Herbert just got paid with a, a friend of mine who's he's a football man, like, you know, doesn't really play fantasy, but just knows what he sees on Sundays. He's like, well, Herbert's pretty good. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you remember what he did last year when he was throwing to Josh Palmer and Jalen Guyton? And that was it. Like, yeah, slow your roll, man. Like, and honestly, one season, half a season, because I want it to come true. Half a season of Lawrence killing it with my Calvin Ridley and Christian Kirk, who I love. And I love that they brought in Bigsby because that could save ETN for better plays and not more plays. Like, I love the offense that they're putting together. So right now, I would say Herbert because it's the safe answer. But give me like three games into the season. And if they come out on a roll, I could I could flip flop that very easily. I mean, I have them at seven and eight, so yeah. I, I like both of them. And I, yeah. I think they're both good, and I yeah. think that's also in the realm of possibility. <laughs> you know, uh, likelihood, actually, more likely. But all right, Fitzy, you are up for your crossroad players. Who is number one? Let's lead off with Jordan Love. And Ooh, come out swinging. This will be the first time the Packers have opened the season with a quarterback other than Brett Favre or Aaron Rodgers leading the offense since 1992. When it was Don Mikowski. And so think about <laughs> everyone remembers Don Mikowski. Don't, don't right. make up names. The, Pat. the magic <laughs> man. Uh, see, think about that. That was 31 years ago. So unless you are around 40 years old or older, you can't remember the Green Bay Packers being directed I, by anyone. I, I am that old and I do Same. not remember that. Yes. Yeah, I don't remember anyone. And, and Mikowski Rogers. wasn't bad. He was perfectly average, but then he got hurt <laughs> early in 92. Favre came in and, you know, Favre was terrific. The rest but is history. As for Love, I mean, I'll be honest, I have no freaking idea how Love is going to do this year. And I'm a Packers fan, but like his infrequent appearances over the first three years of his career have been kind of a mixed bag. I mean, he made the start for Aaron Rodgers in 2021 in Kansas City because Rodgers had COVID and Love was pretty terrible in that game. And then last year when uh, the Eagles were just mopping the deck with the Packers, Love came in, got to play most of the second half and was really sharp, granted against a team that was more or less in the prevent defense because they were protecting a big lead. So um, really hard to tell. And even his college career at Utah State was a mixed bag. Uh, terrific numbers his sophomore year, then in his third and final year, 17 interceptions, and the Packers picked him in the first round anyway the following spring. So um, I do know this about Love, though. Like, if he is good this year, he's going to start again for the Packers in 2024, and uh, if he's terrible, the Packers are going to draft a quarterback in 2024 because if Love is terrible – they're going to have a top 10 draft pick next year, and they're probably going to have the Jets' first round draft pick, too, to possibly use to maneuver up and maybe position themselves for a Drake May type guy. So um, it's truly a crossroads season for Love. Like his ECR right now is quarterback 23 in Dynasty. There's no way he's going to have an ECR in the 20 to 30 range next year. He's either going to be good this year and it's going to be in the top 20. Or he's going to absolutely tank, and he'll probably be out of the top forty. So I completely agree definition with that. of a crossroads player right here. Yeah, I mean, Russ, it's uh, if you ain't this is Ricky Bobby. If you ain't first, you're last here. So he better be good this year uh, in the NFL. Any cliche you want to say, not for long. Whatever it is, strike one and you're out, Jordan Love. Like you know, this is this is your audition, and, and it it sucks for him that. Um, like Fitz said, if he's not good, they're definitely drafting his replacement. So maybe he would start a couple games next year, but they'd be clamoring for the new guy real fast. Uh, if Jordan Love doesn't look good this year, so what do you think? Is he a sink or swim this year? It's it's funny because like you point out that they just two quarterbacks in, in like seventy four years, and this dude has like five games to prove himself. Like that that's. That's not cool, but it's right. It's true. And that's unfortunate for him. And like, you know, coming in on games where he wasn't really, you know, ready, you want this to think that everyone's Mahomes, right? You get one game and then you go out and you throw three touchdowns. I mean, Matt Flynn came out and threw six and we saw how well that went anyway. But 
hey, Russell Wilson came from that one, so I'm still thrilled about it. Uh, <laughs> it yeah, you're absolutely right. But the th he's yeah, he's either their starter for the next couple of years at least, or he's just straight up gone. Uh, 24, 23, I think you said like that's a little lower than I thought it would be, but I get it. It is also because of who he's coming in after the situation, like no one's batted an eye. Well, I guess it was a different time and place you know, when Aaron Rodgers sat for a couple of years, but like no one really wasn't the biggest deal. Like even I remember hearing how much they loved Aaron Rodgers during practice. They used to call him the chameleon quarterback because he could imitate anyone that they were going to be playing against. And I'm just like, all right, I'm excited for this guy to start because that sounds awesome. And like, I expected it. Like I wanted him to come out throwing lefty one game for no reason. Like that, that was like, <laughs> I was a little let down on that one, but like, yeah, Jordan love, there's never been anything great said about him. He comes in and, they shouldn't have drafted him when they did, which makes it even harder that he's been sitting for that long. I mean, I'm glad that kid is still making a lot of money sitting there doing nothing because at least there's that. Um, I, yeah, absolute crossroads. And you're absolutely right. He is either going to push himself up to that 16 area where he's a low end one high end two, or he's going to be in the forties. <laughs> like, yeah, there, there can't be an in between. I, I'll go out on a limb. I think he's going to have a good year. I think he's going to have a pretty good year, Fitz. Uh, I'm excited about him. He could be a Konami code guy, as you would like to call the guys that run like that, uh, if they let him do it. And why wouldn't they? You get one year to do, uh, to, to go and show what you are. Let him do whatever he can. So I think they're going to tailor this offense to him, and I think it's going to make him look pretty good. So I'm well, he's excited. He's got to go out and do it whether or they let him or not. Because yeah, he's why be wouldn't he? For his job. Right. Yeah, and this is an audition for other uh, jobs, too. Yeah. If if they decide you're not good enough, so uh, I'm with you. Fitz. It's, it's I, gonna it's gonna help that they do have one of the best offensive lines in the league, assuming good health for David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins. But uh, you know, I just wish he didn't have like one of the youngest pass catching groups in in NFL history that he was throwing help, to. Yeah. But if he had a good wide receiver, he probably would be on the Packers because they would have taken a wide out where they took him, which is why the Packers uh, fans don't like. Uh, Jordan Love because he should have been a wideout, but that's a different story for a different show. Uh, Fitzy, who's your second player at the crossroads here? It's JT, JK Dobbins Boggs. And, um, you know, he had that devastating knee injury in the 2021 preseason that cost him a year. Came back in week three of last year and still didn't look right. They shut him down. He had cleanup surgery. And then when he came back in December, Man, I mean, he looked really good. 57 carries, 397 yards in his last four games. So almost 100 yards a game and just under seven yards a carry. So like more like his old Ohio State self. Um, but then training camp now, like there's already drama with Dobbins. He was put on the pup list. He also missed the first day of Ravens training camp entirely. And when John Harbaugh was asked about it, his response was, I wish it was a simple answer. There's always a lot of things that go into football, but there's some complexity to it. And we're working through all that. JK is working through it and I'm looking forward to when he's out there. So what does that mean? Is it knee related? Is it contractual since Dobbins is still- I think it's contractual yeah, playing, because it's all all those guys. Right, and he's on his rookie He's stuff. on his rookie deal, but then of course, because of the injuries, he hasn't really proven himself. So why is he you know, trying to do this, this weird holdout thing? So, um, yeah, and the other thing, like, we we have not seen what he can do as a pass catcher in the NFL. Like, he was pretty good at it at Ohio State, but the um, the old offense just didn't give him the chance. And now maybe with Todd Monken, he does get a chance. So um, the Ravens just, they signed Melvin Gordon, who, who may or may not have anything left. Um, just a lot of questions about J.K. Dobbins going into this year. And I sense that his value is either going to go way up or way down. Uh, kind of like Jordan Love. Yeah, Russ, uh, J.K. Dobbins, ECR, running back 16 right now. But his finishes in his two seasons where he's played, RB33, and then last year, RB35. Of course, he wasn't a full-time guy in uh, 2020. They ran Lamar and Gus Edwards more times than him. He only has 251 touches over his two seasons and only 25 re receptions. Uh, where do you where do you see this guy, Dobbins? I mean... 
hopefully they start throwing to the running backs more, but they're just like the Eagles where they don't do it that much. Monken should change this offense and, and maybe they throw to him more. Is this the year we see Dobbins break out and look good? Or is he just kind of a hype machine every year and we're just never going to get to that peak? Well, when you have a rushing quarterback, you're always going to get less passes to the backs because it's usually like, oh, God, don't hit me, don't hit me, don't hit me, dump off. Take you know. on, Barkley! <clears throat> it works, man. Um, <laughs> like, it's, it, it's rough because another one of these things where Dobbins was by far my favorite running back coming in in 2020. I greatly understood that Jonathan Taylor was better, that that it is what it is, that's fine. But Dobbins was easily my favorite. And then he landed on Baltimore. And I was like 80% stoked about it because you're right. 20% is you want those receptions. But he looked good whenever he was on the field. You know, that year where Ingram was scoring like 16 touchdowns a game, <laughs> yeah. Dobbins still came in at the end of the season and put up like six or seven, looked pretty good. The unfortunate knee injury and you could even see by the end of the season when he was still almost getting 100 yards a game he got caught on every run like he was not full strength whatsoever because he was slow but still really good so i'm i'm riding with my same things i do with everyone in this ravens offense hopefully this offense just gets that much better uh, whatever it's the preseasons i do you know the best i can fingers and ears eyes closed la 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 whenever anyone's <laughs> missing camp like garrett wilson just walked off the field he rolled his ankle but no, no no he's fine he's fine he's fine he's fine like, everybody gets carted off i mean yeah. you you have a hangnail they'll cart you off so yeah that exactly. gets big like, big news too every single time man man not this finger's really hurting me i don't want to walk to the sidelines cart cart get on the cart get on the cart yeah so I, I do my best to ignore whatever the, he the heck is going on right now. And, and I'm, th I'm there with Dobbins, so I'm ignoring all of this. All I can say is if he's healthy, if this offense takes the step forward, he's going to do very well for fantasy. Same thing with Swift, though. It's too late for him to really boost his dynasty value all that much. It, you know, he's going to go into his second contract. We have the younger guys, the guys who catch the ball more. And I, I'm fine with that because I don't like you know, spending on running back. So give me these guys I can spend mid RB2 prices, but we'll have weekly upside of maybe the RB1 on a really good Baltimore game. You know, so I, I'm in on Dobbins. I have, I recently have traded for many, many shares of him. I, I, I collect football cards. I went and I just got a bunch of Swift and Dobbins just in case they blow <laughs> up. I'm ready for it. You know, like I, I'm all in on, on Dobbins right now. And I am completely in denial that there's an other side to him just doing awesome this year but you're absolutely right if he doesn't show out he's just gonna drop fits if i gave you the the same question as i did before dobbins is an rb1 after this year or an rb3 which one is more likely i'm gonna i'm gonna say three i don't think he catches enough passes to get to, to rb1 value and that's fair and he'll probably end up being an rb2 but yet that's you know that's where you got to do the dance is, you know, this is a run first team that I would rather, I'd rather take my shot on Dobbins and take my shot on Bateman, even though I know his career is going to be shorter because I think Dobbins can get to a higher plateau than I think Bateman can in that type of offense, even though we haven't seen it or how it works. I mean, Georgia is still a run first team last year. So uh, I, I believe in the running ability of Dobbins. So uh, I'll take my shot on him before we get to uh, Fitz's third guy here. Let me ask you, is that trade offer you received a boom or bust for your team? Stop guessing and get instant analysis with our trade analyzer at fantasypros.com slash analyzer. Whether it's a two for one, three for two, or an even trade, the trade analyzer has got your back. It's also perfect for dynasty leagues and supports trades with draft picks. The trade analyzer lets you see how your league power rankings shift before and after the trade. Navigate your negotiations with confidence and head over to fantasypros.com slash analyzer to start evaluating your trade offers now also if you love the show and you want to interact with us directly then pat and i will be answering questions each week for premium subscribers on fridays at 5 p.m eastern over at our discord at fantasypros.com slash dynasty slash dynasty chat go check it out we are there every single friday as long as i am not in the grave and still have a voice uh by friday uh, i will be there Fitzy, who is your last crossroad player here? It's Chase Claypool. 
And it is going to take a whole lot of failure for me to completely give up on a wide receiver who is 6'4", 238 pounds, and runs a 4-4, and was a second-round NFL draft pick. Like Our buddies at playerprofiler.com have this thing called a speed score metric, and um, it basically combines a player's 40 time with his weight, and Claypool has a 100th percentile speed Mm -hmm. score. I mean, this dude, Megatron. Yep. I mean, that's why he's Mapletron. You know, Calvin yep. Johnson was Megatron, just as big, just as fast. And, you know, Claypool's Canadian, so the Maple thing. But, um, <laughs> yeah, and this guy, I mean, he had nine touchdowns as a rookie, and his first two seasons in the league cleared 800 yards. So, um, you know, it's not like he was really bad his first two seasons. His first bad season was year three last year. When he, uh, you know, missed a couple of games with a sprained knee and was traded midseason to a very run heavy team. So it would be easy for me to give him a mulligan on 2022. You know, the guy just turned 25 earlier this month. But we also know that Claypool can be kind of a knucklehead. And Boggs, you and I have talked about this game, the, the 2021 game against the Vikings, where the Steelers are down I'm eight. I'm still mad about it. Down eight, your Steelers in the final minute of the game, Claypool catches a pass while they're in the hurry up, goes through this elaborate first down gesture. And then when one of the linemen tries to take the ball away from him, he shoves the lineman. Um, I, I feel like he was just destined to get traded after that. But lo and behold, the Steelers found a team that was willing to give up a second round pick for him. Uh, the Bears, Ryan Poles, winds up being the first pick of the second round in this year's draft. I mean, that was a Joey ter- Porter Jr. I'll take it. Yes, that that was a terrible trade for the Bears, but uh, it, nonetheless, Ryan Poles wanted this guy on the Bears. He wanted this guy on the team, and you know he still got that size and speed to dream on, um, but. You know, Claypool himself has acknowledged this is going to be the biggest year of his life. And like, I don't know that he needs to be a thousand yard guy to rekindle our interest in him in the dynasty community, but like he needs to do something. And, you know, now he's got increased target competition with DJ Moore in town, with Darnell Mooney coming back from an injury. So it's going to be interesting to see Boggs. Um, I, I still have some hope here, but that hope could be greatly diminished if 2023 does not go well for Chase Claypool. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a Claypool guy probably because I'm a Steelers fan, but I also understand that, you know, Claypool came out swinging 11 touchdowns that first season, nine through the air, two on the ground. And the last two seasons combined, he's had three. So, you know, it's just, it's not, It doesn't look great. He goes to a run heavy offense that also traded for DJ Moore and they just gave the bag to Cole Komet. So I think maybe those guys are one, two in the pecking order right now. Darnell Mooney, not a slouch either. So Claypool has all the physical tools to get here, Russ, but I don't know if he's ever going to put it together between the years and it's run first run heavy offense here in Chicago with Justin Fields. So I just really don't like his place in that offense either. Not saying he can't, you know, break out and still be a good player. I would think it would probably be somewhere other than Chicago, though, if he did. And who knows how long that's going to take. So what is your thought on Chase Claypool moving forward here, Russ? <sighs> <laughs> yep. I uh, the, the right noise. This this is the first one, like, I think he's passed the crossroads already. And it has nothing – it's not necessarily his fault. Like he went from a situation, his rookie year, which was perfect for him, where it was someone who was capable of just getting it high. And it was like Eli Manning throwing to Plaxico Burris, just get it high enough. And Mm -hmm. Claypool will still be able to catch it. And he could do things with it because like, he's way too athletic for the size and shape that he is. And, and then Kenny Pickett came along and Mitchell Trubisky and all. It was just like, oof, and the offense just got worse and worse. And then you're right. Getting traded was the best thing for him. And then it went very poorly with where he went. <laughs> um, so he he definitely has the ability to make the people who believe in him continue to believe. 
But I think you're going to find far too much of the community out on him already, which will be great for you because you'll be able to send late seconds and go get yourself some Chase Claypool on your teams. And yeah, when he has those random four touchdown games, that's going to work out real well for you because we've literally seen him capable of rushing and receiving multiple touchdowns in, in one game. So I, he's a great play. I hate the phrase. He's great for best ball, but <laughs> well, he is. yeah, but like, in most of the leagues I play, you start 10 players. And especially like if you're like Scott Fishbowl land where you have to start three wide receivers, having someone like Chase Claypool at the bottom of your roster is fantastic because if the top of your roster is strong enough, having someone with that ceiling that you paid so little to get is, is great. But I think that's really where he's stuck. I think that's where he is as a fantasy asset. And again, you need that. Like that player needs, we need those players in a 12 team start 10 league. But uh, he might <laughs> have taken a couple steps away from the crossroads in my mind already. Yeah. Too much him and Han for confidence on Chase Claypool from Russ, there, I would say. Uh, look, his finishes last year was bad. Wide receiver 82, obviously. Injuries in traded and blah, blah, blah. Wide receiver 40 in his second year. Wide receiver 35 in his first rookie season. Um, I, most of his, a lot of his production is going to be tied to touchdowns. I think that's what he's going to be, especially in a run-heavy offense. So I'm going to set the over at five and a half touchdowns. 11 in his first season fits two and then one if i set it at five and a half are you saying that claypool goes over that or under that this year oh general pessimism about the bears offense <laughs> well i don't know man I, I'm I, the man yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm a fields fan but i just wonder if he's going to generate enough passing touchdowns for him to get there so i'd say under okay uh, russ five and a half what are you going I'm actually feeling a little optimistic about this because, okay. like you said, his stats will land on touch. Well, his fantasy output will land on touchdowns. And when you get to the red zone, like Cole Komet's a big body, but he's not that imposing target that Claypool is. So I think you're going to see a lot of back corner fades, a lot of uh, right at the post, you know, jumping over everybody, like pretend throw away, but you just, again, throw it high enough where he's probably the only human being on the yeah. field capable of catching it. So I think there's definitely a possibility and a likely one where he does put up a good seven, 10 touchdowns. But when you're also averaging like two, three catches a game mm -hmm. and like maybe 40 yards, even though you still get 120 every once in a while, you're not going to feel great about starting him unless it's that week and you won't know that till afterwards. <laughs> yeah, that touchdown is your make or break for his production most weeks. So uh, got to get it. Uh, we'll go through mine a little bit faster here because I don't have all my players, I think, are lower than the guys that we've mentioned here. Maybe Claypool is the lowest that we've mentioned here. But uh, let's start out with your boy, A.J. Dillon Fitzy. His ECR is RB33 in uh, PPR, which is most dynasty formats or ppr his finishes have been rb38 rb36 and rb94 when he wasn't even playing in his rookie seasons his last two seasons and touches it's 221 214 he's a ufa next year i i like aj dylan i saw him you know at boston college he was the only show in town they knew what was coming and he still ran over people so i like aj dylan but aaron jones is one of the best running backs in the nfl so it's hard to move past that guy but he, if he wants a big contract and he wants to start for someone and not be a B back next to another player, he's going to have to have a big year. Can we see it from him out of a team that should run more now that Aaron Rodgers is gone? What do you think about AJ Dillon for your Packers, Fitzy? I thought we were going to see it maybe last year when Devontae Adams was gone, and I figured they'd throw more or run more and throw to their backs more last year, and it really didn't happen at all. And uh, I'm kind of out on Dylan Boggs. I, I think he's just a between the tackles plotter. I, I, like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, he's tough to tackle, but I don't think he has the juice and the burst that Derrick Henry has. I don't think he's going to, yeah. he's got Derrick Henry upside. No way. Like, that's not AJ Dylan. And like, he's got a really limited pass catch. We saw the upside with him a couple of years ago with pass catching, where like he had a modest number of targets, but was really efficient with them. Like, that's the ceiling with his targets. And and that was still only what, like a 29 catch sees. I don't have the, his numbers in front of me, but like it wasn't enough to really move the needle. 
Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Uh, Russ, what do you think about A.J. Dillon? Is this a guy that can move into RB2-1 status, or is he stuck at, in, in neutral like RB3 moving forward in his career? I think he's stuck at RB3. Uh, he is – this is a very strange sentence. He's the human version of Derrick Henry, like because Derrick <laughs> Henry is not a human being. like, and, and that was always the kind of – at least the rap that I've seen around Dylan. He needed a very specific situation to do as well as we wanted him to do, and the Packers was never it because it seemed like when they had Jamal Williams, they had to find roles and between Williams and Jones. And then they're like, wait, we have two very good running backs, so let's just mix them in and whatever happens, happens. And it worked really well, and Aaron Jones usually got the better of it because he was better. But they went back to those roles. Like A.J. Dillon caught like maybe, it felt like five passes on the season. He, for some reason, though, didn't get all of the goal line work. It, like it seemed like they weren't ready just to be like, okay, go, which – again, led me to believe that they were ditching Aaron Jones this year. Like last year, run him into the ground. Next year, we're not going to have Rodgers and let's run with Dylan for like the last year of his contract. But Aaron Jones is still there. Like there, there's no reason for it to change. I have him on a couple of teams. I Well, I have enough teams that I have pretty much every player on a couple <laughs> right, of teams. Right, right. But it's not someone – A.J. Dillon is not someone I'm, I'm super excited to see on my roster. But I – I, it's, it's funny. Like I start saying these things and I'm like, wait, these are human beings. I hope he does well. Like, you know, <laughs> as a person, it, like, I hope he does well, but I, I'm not betting anything on it real. Yeah, I understand that. Look, I, I, I like AJ Dillon and I think that he gets, he can, if he can get out of Green Bay and he can go to somewhere where he can be the main guy, if he goes to like yeah. Tampa Bay next year maybe Rashad White doesn't work out whatever he goes to Miami you know where you're still going to use a bunch of backs but one guy could be the main guy there next year like if he goes into one one of those spots I'm going to be all in uh because I still like him but he's got to land in the right situation and do that he has to show out this year and that is where I don't know if we get it because Aaron Jones is too good uh unless Mother Nature just catches up with Aaron Jones this year and uh, say that out loud. Beats don't him into the dirt. Loud. So I don't have any shares of him. I'll say it all I want. Uh, <laughs> to... For me, please don't say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Russ. Sorry, Russ. Uh, I'm going to lump these next two wide receivers together because I do think that they're very similar. And ECR has him uh, similarly ranked here. Elijah Moore is a ECR wide receiver 43. His finishes last year was wide receiver 100 because he didn't play. And it was wide receiver 32, but remember, he was like a top 10 wide out for the last four weeks in um, 2020. So he was, uh, or 2021, he was excellent. Uh, second round pick, he still hasn't hit 50 receptions yet. Part of it is bad quarterback play, coach doghouse and all that stuff. But now he's going to have to work behind Amari Cooper in another run first offense. So I'm a little, I'm not as excited as some people, but there's a lot of skill for Elijah Moore. The other guy, Gabe Davis. ECR wide receiver 46. His finishes have been 42 last year, 79, 75. He's a post hype sleeper. Last year's assertion that he could possibly be better than Stefan Diggs by people was laughable. Uh, but we might be too low on him now. And they haven't added a Hopkins or anybody else. Like, you know, Stefan Diggs had a whole little crybaby fit about that a couple weeks ago. And this is another guy that hasn't had 50 catches in a season, but he does have 20 touchdowns in three years. So, Elijah Moore, Gabe Davis, Fitzy, who would you rather have between them? And do you think either one of them will move up this year? I would rather have Moore. I'm optimistic he'll move up. I mean, the only thing I don't really like about Moore is that he kind of pulled a diva routine last year because he wasn't getting the ball from Zach Wilson. But it's like, okay, we get it, dude. Your quarterback sucks. You're not getting the ball as much. (laughs) But, like, just shut up and the quarterback situation will get better. Um, You know, for him to, like, kind of sulk his way off the team, I don't know. We'll see if that becomes an issue for him in his career, like a little bouts of uh, petulance like that. But um, <laughs> I'm optimistic about the talent. As for Davis, so yes, I, I'm kind of willing to give him a pass last year. It's possible that the high ankle sprain that he had early in the season lingered. And then we saw Josh Allen with the elbow injury that sort of t- um, 
thwarted his passing numbers late in the season. My, my one concern with Davis is that he just hasn't. It, it's the George Pickens thing that we've talked about, Bob. Yeah. Just the ability to consistently command targets. Um, we haven't seen that from Davis. So Russ said it before, like the, the good for best ball phrase. Um, Davis yeah. is a good for best ball guy for sure, yep. but he is a, a tough guy in a managed league because you know you're going to get some great weeks probably, and you're going to get some weeks where you don't even know he's there. Yeah, Russ Moore is my guy between these two dudes as well, and it's because I think he's a more complete wide receiver. I think that Gabe Davis is a deep threat, and I think he's not probably going to uh, amount to much more than that. Not saying he can't, but I don't see it. He's got to prove it to everybody. I think Elijah Moore more hasn't just had the shot, right? It's, you know, your little crybaby last year, so you relegated the bench, and you had a good year the year before, but it's been some rough QB play. So I think even though these guys are so close, only separated by three guys here, I'm just much more optimistic about Elijah Moore. What do you think? Like, imagine if he didn't pull that diva routine and he had Aaron Rodgers throwing yeah. him the ball with Garrett Wilson on the other side. Like, mm. that is beautiful. Like, I get it. Like, my brain doesn't work the way, f like, football, like, athletes in general work. Like, I don't have that competitiveness in me. So being the number two sounds wonderful because <laughs> the mother dude's getting hit a lot more, getting covered a lot more. And I just look good because I have the second to third best coverage on the team. Um, but even still, when you think about it, he he landed in a really good spot because, yeah, Amari Cooper's there. Amari Cooper, in my head, is eternally like 23, but he's like 28, 29 now. And while he is the kind of player that gets by on his footwork, not on his speed, so he's not really going to age out, but... Elijah Moore is really, really good, and he does have that good route running also, and showed that he could be one-ish, you know, X-ish on his team. And while DPJ has, you know, Donovan Peoples-Jones has his moments, and I mean, I think they ended up with Tillman, right? You know, the, yeah. they drafted another tall wide receiver. I'm a sucker for an X-type wide receiver. Um, but I think Moore can easily work a nice slot role where he does not leave the field anytime there's three wide receivers there and then only evolve from there short of getting in another technician of a wide receiver will i ever now at this point be worried because you want elijah moore on the field with another tall dude on the other side because they don't do the same thing right but if they're both good they both have weakened defense on them because you need to worry about multiple people so i'm in on more and well, Deshaun Watson as a football player is very good. You know, he's, he's talented. So I'm not worried about that. Like we were worried about Zach Wilson, Mike White, and Joe Flacco and all of that. And Gabe Davis, good for best ball. Like I have <laughs> a lot of teams for the same exact reason I said about Claypool. Yeah. I love having him on the bottom of my rosters, the bottom of my starters, because there's a chance. I was at a, a Jets game last year. The Jets were playing the Dolphins and of course, not only was Tua hurt, but then Skylar Thompson got hurt. So I'm watching like dudes I'd never heard of play uh, quarterback. And oh no, it was Tua was hurt. And then Teddy Bridgewater got hurt on the second play. And I was watching Skylar Thompson, who at the time, no one knew who the heck he was. Mm -hmm. um, and I look at the scoreboard. And of course, now we're in the world where fantasy football stats are on NFL scoreboards. And it's wonderful. Of course. And you see... Gabe Davis, one catch, 90 yards, touchdown. I'm like, that was against oh. the Steelers. Yeah, I remember that one. Oh, and then I sneeze and I look at the scoreboard and it's two for 166 and two touchdowns. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, like, that's yep. that, like, you like you said, that's the upside of Gabe Davis. You'll get that twice a season, probably. And honestly, like, even though Dalton Kincaid plays another position, that worries me for Gabe Davis because being the pass catcher three on the Bills, is, it's not great, but it's great for the Bills because he'll be the most dependable wide receiver three. They've cat, pass catcher three they've had in a while. You know, they tried with McKenzie and uh, Beasley, other guys I'm completely blanking on that they had to bring back Cole Beasley for a while. You know, like, so... Like, so hopefully it works out well. He finds his place in that offense. Diggs doesn't seem long for that team for the way he's talking. So maybe Davis finds some more work, but 
Yeah, I think you're right. I think another bad season and even the the truthers that have dug their heels in for years might start loosening their foothold on that one. Yeah, I mean, but both these guys have upside, but I, Mo, Elijah Moore is the guy that I want to buy if I'm buying one of them yeah. in that spot. The last guy Absolutely. I'll mention here, Paris Campbell, ECR 87. He was wide receiver 60 last year, but the previous three seasons, he only played 14 games total. And are we done with the injury issues in his first three seasons is a big question about Paris Campbell. He went 91 targets, 63 catches, 623 and three touchdowns last season with some horrendous QB play in Indy. Uh, the Giants have an opening for a number one target player on their team. Saquon led in targets last year. They signed Campbell and Waller to help. They drafted Jalen Hyatt. They are looking high and low for a guy. And there's a lot of hype on Paris Campbell this offseason about how they're going to use him on trick plays and reverses and out of the backfield and all this stuff. I, I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of buying in a little bit because there is opportunity for the Giants fit. So like as a last round flyer, if I'm trading for a late round draft pick, something like that, like I, I'll go and try and see if Paris Campbell can do it. Although, you know, his skill set is slot only, you know, can't get off of, uh, you know, a jam at the line, that kind of stuff. He's undersized. He can still be valuable. What do you think about Paris Campbell? You think this is it? He gets on a roll with the Giants or he probably gets hurt again and we can be done. I think he's going to be one of those guys who always has trouble staying healthy. And while I think he's talented, I don't know if he's so talented to be able to distinguish himself from amongst this just deep group of wide receivers and deep group of slot receivers the Giants have. I yeah. feel like this team is destined to have like no one with more than about 620 receiving yards mm -hmm. this year, but about like five guys between 350 and 620. Yeah, it feels bad for New York, Russ. I mean, you know, uh, I don't expect Waller to stay healthy because he never does. Uh, you know, is Sterling Shepard even alive? I, I don't know what's going on with him. You know, Slayton loves to drop footballs. Uh, Paris Campbell, this is why Saquon led them in targets last year. You know, it's not great there. So uh, what do you think about Paris Campbell? Do you think he can, he can do it in New York? Would you take a flyer on him or is he someone you're ignoring? I will never, ever give up on Paris Campbell. <laughs> I I don't know what it is about him. I like I told you I collect cards. I have a set of cards of all the players I believe in when they came in whether they ended up good like I have my JJ Arthigo white side card over there. Like that's cool. that's that's the level. Um but I have my Paris Campbell card sitting over there. I'm ready for it. I It's really funny. The Giants are doing something that I've you've never really seen in the NFL before. They they have a plan and they know how many of their players get hurt. So like, all right, we have Sterling Shepard. He gets hurt a lot. Let's let's get let's draft Wanzel Robinson. Okay, okay. <laughs> Paris Campbell. Yes. Okay, cool. Let's go. Let's go. Cole Beasley's free. Okay, we need a slot receiver, and I don't care who gets hurt. We're gonna have one on our team. Like, so I, I'm ready for it. I'm here. It if every time Paris Campbell has been on the field and healthy on a We'll call it functional offense. He's done really well. It seems like, you know, Pat, you're right. His body might not be able to hold up the NFL, in which case I hope he's at least pass catcher three on their team so he doesn't take 15 hits a game. You know, let him catch six balls because his ADOT is like two. <laughs> You know, right? Like he doesn't, he doesn't have to walk. He doesn't have to run very far before he catches the ball. But usually, that means he gets hit by linebackers, and that doesn't bode well for a small man like him. I, I want it to work out. I really, 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 really do because I really do like Paris Campbell. I will say it is cautious optimism at this point, <laughs> but I will until the day he plays a full season and it just doesn't work out. I will be like, if once he's healthy, he could do it. He could be in the league for 16 years. Once he's healthy, he'll do it. Russ, he has a walker, but he's, he looks real good with that walker. <laughs> he could fight off a defenseman with it. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. Push over a linebacker with it. Yeah. If I if I said you could have Claypool for a second or Campbell for a fourth, what are you doing? Oh, Campbell, very, very easily. Uh, because honestly, whether it's – assuming PPR league, let's put it that way. Right. Because it, it's, it's Claypool's touchdowns or the – 
number of plays we can get out of Campbell in a game. Because again, it you know, I mean, remember Jarvis Landry on the Dolphins? Like, right. it wasn't pretty, but it got the, got job, the job done. done. And then yeah. he got that one year where he scored double digit touchdowns and was the wide receiver three. Not saying that's Paris Campbell or anything, but like, it's a physical possibility. It's a way that it could absolutely work. And I want it to happen, but it's also rough because I really like Wondell Robinson. I really like Darren Waller. Like, and it doesn't hurt that I live in New Jersey and I can go watch them play. Yeah. Even though tickets are so much cheaper. Um, but like, I don't know what this offense is going to look like because again, they have so many of the same thing. And then they have Slayton and Hyatt on the other side. Which, so they're probably going to bring in one more speedster just in case. So I, I really like Paris Campbell. I'm not going to give up on him. And, and like you said before, the great thing is you send someone a third for Paris Campbell and there's going to be like, yeah, fine, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you, if you like him, you can get him. And that is always a good thing in this game where you don't have to fight to get the – like everybody loves Justin, Justin Jefferson. You're not getting them very easily. Right, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, but Prime out of Campbell, my cold, dead hands. Right, yeah. yeah. Paris Campbell, you want him. You could very easily find a way to put him on your roster. The money ball move is getting Paris Campbell, I think, is where we're falling on this. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so go get him for a cheap pick. And what do you think about these crossroad players? Who's going to make it? Who is going to fail? And who did we miss? Let us know in the comments. We would love it. So that will wrap it up for Crossroads Player. You can follow us on Twitter, at Bogman Sports for myself, at Fitz underscore FF for Fitzy, and at Dynasty Outhouse for Russ. We will see you guys next week. Take it easy, everybody.